Hello there and welcome to this week's episode of The Retro. I'm your host, Tracy Lee. You can follow me on Twitter at Lady Leet, and I'm joined by my other host, Rob. Yeah, I'm Rob Osell. You can find me on Twitter at RoboCell. We have some really exciting content today. I'm really excited about our double click where we get to talk about bit.dev, which is a really cool new way to start thinking about how to architect your apps uh, via components. So really, really, really looking forward to talking about that. Yeah, Tracy, one of my, one of my uh, tech leads always used to say, you know, it's all ones and zeros, it all, it's all bits. So finally today we'll get to learn a little bit more about bits and see learn what it's all about. Learn a little bit more about bits. Ooh, there we go. See, good. Bit marketing team, get in contact. <laughs> we we got you. Uh, and then in the subtweet segment, we are going to be talking about burnout. It's an issue that affects a lot of developers. We feel it all really keenly, especially this time of the year in this state of the world. Um, so we're going to be talking about it: how to identify it that it's happening, what to do once you start to experience it, and you know what it all means. <laughs> And now it's time for the subtweet where we talk about, well, the things we've been talking about lately online and give you the information that you need to have smarter conversations going forward. Now, Tracy, today we are talking about a topic that unfortunately most software developers know at least a little bit about, and that is burnout. There's been kind of a lot of conversations lately of people making major moves because they're burnt out. So I was just seeing Harry Roberts, who was posting recently about his strategies for dealing with burnout and 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 what it sort of looks like, how long it takes him to do what used to be five minute tasks, and that he goes out and bikes all day uh, to kind of reset his brain. Um, another one of our good friends, Sarah Vieira, uh, recently backed away from her job citing burnout. And uh, John Cooperman is another one of our friends who wrote a big blog about his experiences with burnout and how he's moving away from his job too. So I just thought that this was a great topic to bring up because I think, again, this is something that a lot of people deal with. So Tracy, have you ever experienced burnout? Yes, I so have. And I don't... I, I think like it's it's very much about understanding yourself, right? So like me, for example, right now, I, I for some reason, like I used to love working on the weekends, not like, hey, I'm bugging my team or whatever, but oh, it's a Sunday or a Saturday. Oh my gosh, I get like a few hours to just like get what I need done, clean it up, you know? Um, and I go through phases like that. But right now I'm in the phase of, Friday night hits and I literally delete Slack from my phone. I delete the Gmail app from my phone and, you know, fine, I'll check it if I need to. But that helps that like forces me to not get into the mode of burnout. Um, so, you know, I, th I think we all deal with some level of burnout on different levels. But I think it's also, again, like everybody's different, right? one person's idea of burnout might be like somebody else's opinion of dude that's what i do on a saturday what are you talking about yeah i mean it, it, what's interesting about it is that burnout doesn't necessarily have a fixed definition it's yeah. more of a an emotion it's almost like a realization that you have so my burnout story is that i once worked with a team that you know to make a long story short was forced to make good on a commitment uh, that was made with a different party. Okay. And so somebody else came in and even though a uh, sort of a commitment had been renegotiated, somebody came in and, and sort of, uh, enforced the original terms of the agreement. <laughs> and so as a team, we had each other's backs and we said, you know what, we're going into this all with, of one mind. We're going to make this happen because we like this client that we're working with. We are going to hit this deadline for this client. And we were working, you know, get up in the morning, maybe work out a little bit, get into the office early, work all day, come home at like 9 30, 10 o'clock at night, try to wind down a little bit, get to bed, re rinse, repeat every day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner at work. And that worked for about three months. We did it for an entire summer <laughs> and we delivered and it was a huge accomplishment. And the paradoxical thing sometimes about things that like crunch and burnout is that it brought the team weirdly closer together, but the realization afterwards is just that you have pushed so hard, your body demands that release, that reward. 
And what we realized is that that three month period of crunch and burnout led to us delivering more slowly for almost the whole next year, at least for the first six months, got That's nothing crazy. out of it. So you paid three months of crunch, but or you got three months of crunch, but you paid six months of productivity for it on the back end. As a peer dollars thing, if you're a manager, crunch never pays. Okay, um, seriously though, Rob, every single executive, I hope people forward it to every single executive because I see executives making this decision all the time and they don't realize what the cost is. And the oh, cost uh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. they absolutely don't. And the problem is, is that once you've done it, once you've inflicted burnout on somebody, it's not fixable in the sense of you can't throw money at it. You can't promote your way out of it. You can't give someone a weekend off or even a week off to fix it. Burnout for everybody, it manifests differently and at different strengths at different times. And there is no way to rush it. You have to let yourself heal. So if you feel burnt out, if work, if you just can't focus on work, things that should be taking short amount of time are taking too long, you loathe coming to work, you just, you know, there's a lot of feelings of burnout. And if that's happening to you, what you need to realize is some of the things that Tracy mentioned, cut down anything that's contributing to the burnout. So me personally, same thing as you, Tracy, I turn off social media. <laughs> I try not to get more enga enragement engagement in. I deleted like, Twitter from my phone like one year ago. So I only can log in via Twitter, uh, the Twitter uh, PWA, right? Or, or, you know, Twitter mobile, whatever you call it. Like I deleted the app. But the same thing, I didn't realize that, but that was one thing that I've been doing for the past year to help me not burn out. Right. And so this is sort of like after the fact, mm -hmm. if you notice that you're burned out or you're, that you're burning out, um, is just to immediately, it's like a ship taking on water. Just get as much out as you can, you know, cut down on your commitments, ask friends to maybe help out or possibly even a spouse, but be careful not to impose too much on other people. You know, like maybe you, uh, if you have the disposable income, maybe you look to getting something like a maid service to help around the house. Anything that you can do to sort of lighten any of your cognitive loads will help you stop burning out more. But the healing process, it's like getting any type of sports injury. Uh, I once had this, Tracy, where I, I was injured for, it seemed like two years because every time I would let my knee heal, as soon as I would heal enough that I felt like I could run, I immediately was like, well, I've been resting for a month. I got to get back out there. And I would push myself too hard, too fast. And it works similar. At least my experience has been similar with burnout, which is that if you try to, if you don't give yourself time to fully heal, you'll fall right back into it. It's kind of like a repetitive stress injury. So burnout is a tricky thing and you really do yeah. need to um, manage it carefully, both as a person, as an individual, and also as a project manager. If you see signs of burnout, you need to immediately start addressing it because it's already too late to stop something. But yeah. every more step you take, you're paying even more on the far side of it. And I'll also go to say that like, it's a very delicate balance, right? Like, um, you know, we've had some engineers at this thought experience burnout on things that we wouldn't have considered burnout, but you know, that sucks. So like for us, it was like, oh my gosh, we realized that. And you know, we realized it too late because you know, we put them in that situation, um, you know, but, but at this dot, it's a very different experience than my last startup where we were growing so fast and everybody was working like till midnight and then waking up at seven and crunching and working on the weekends, right? Like at this thought, we don't do that at all. We have boundaries when it comes to work-life balance, but is it to say that like that startup life that I led before was wrong or different or, or you know, or, you know, burnout? I mean, no, it's just a different culture, right? So I think it's really about also finding, um, the culture that matches you, but then also as an individual, um, being bendable as well, if you if you get what I'm saying. Like, you kind of have to want to develop and grow in certain areas. Um, and developing and growing doesn't mean like 
okay, working nine to five burns me out. I better start trying to work nine to six and get over it, right? Um, growing in areas is also understanding before you get burnt out and being able to control that, right? Uh, versus like, if I hadn't started turning Slack and uh, my mail app, if I hadn't started deleting it, like I would definitely be burnt out right now. Yeah, I mean, you definitely want to learn your own sort of triggers for, yeah. for burnout. And again, the thing is, is that burnout is not something you see coming, generally speaking. Burnout is a, a realization that you come to more strongly over time. And you're right, as you become more finely attuned to this, if you've experienced it enough times, you start to see your own triggers. Like, I'm unusually grumpy, or I'm unusually tired, you know, these types of things. And you start to develop those strategies. Absolutely, that should be in everybody's toolbox. But, you know, we've talked a lot about working hard. Burnout can also come from people. Um, there's particular people that you work with or that you just can't get along with and just being on a team with them or around them often can lead to burnout. It can also just be you're changing. Like you said, sometimes you loved, you know, you can be in a position where you love that grind mentality, but maybe you're in a different season of your life yeah. or because, you know, as with everything going on in the world, maybe in this pandemic life, this is not the time that you feel that way. That is also okay. So it can be a lifestyle. It can be a career choice. It can be a person. There's so many different things that can cause burnout, but it usually all manifests in the same way. Um, and the only other thing that I would recommend to people to do is to just have a develop a network of people with whom you can be open and honest. This doesn't, sometimes this isn't your boss. Um, it hopefully is, uh, but it, it doesn't, it isn't always. And so, you know, can, do you have a mentor? Do you have a close friend? Do you have a spouse? Somebody that you can talk to because a lot of times getting that external perspective, um, to know that you're not sort of suffering and, and burning out silently, that that can be a big help. That is a big help for me as well. Like if somebody Therapist. can recognize it. Therapist, and, yeah. Right, yeah, and people can kind of clear some space for you. Uh, yeah. It's a it, it's a team thing. Uh, burnout, burnout is real. It's unfortunately a big part of our industry uh, and it doesn't look like it's going away, unfortunately. So I think it behooves everyone to take a moment, uh, you know, reach out. If you've never experienced burnout, first of all, congrats. Uh, second of all, um, you know, maybe reach out to the people that do because, you know, maybe you've experienced a smaller version of it and you just haven't noticed yet. And, and again, having those conversations, empathizing with people that are experiencing it will really help you develop the strategy so that when it happens to you, maybe, you know, you don't feel it quite as strongly. Yeah. I remember I had this boyfriend um, who, you know, at, the po at that point in my life, I was like, okay, do you do JavaScript? If you don't do JavaScript, we're not dating. Like that was kind of where I was. And so we had this relationship where, you know, he worked a nine to five. So he worked nine to five. I did too. And then he got home and then we ate dinner and then he worked till two o'clock in, in the evening. And I did too. And we're kind of like working together in a sense. Um, and then, you know, wake up at, you know, eight in the morning on a Saturday and like, ooh, so exciting. We get to go to hackerspace and like hang out and work until midnight. It's going to be so awesome. Right. And in the beginning, it was totally cool. And for me, I was like, you know, I mean, it's like, okay, 11 o'clock comes around. All right, I'm out of the loop. You know, I'm out of that headspace. And then it took me an hour to get back into the headspace. And then I was super productive and everything like that. And um, that was amazing. And that was great. And I, I loved it because I was building the muscle to like, understand what it meant to work on a different level. And that was really healthy in a lot of ways, but also in a lot of ways, long-term for me, I was like, dude, is this going to be my life? I'm not excited about that. Right. Like, you know, I mean, it's life isn't just about code. At least I didn't feel like it was at that time. So, um, you know, needless to say, like that relationship didn't work out. So that's one thing I would consider again. It's like, you know, if you're burnt out, like talk. I'll also relate. It's all about relationships, right? Your relationship with your employer, uh, your relationship with your team. Like, do you want to work it out? Do you want to have those conversations? Uh, it's probably healthy <laughs> to try to have those conversations than just like leave and, and hop to the next thing and, and, and kind of like develop again those relationships where you can create a healthy environment for yourself. Yeah. And as we round up this topic, I think it's really tempting yeah. sometimes for people when you are in burnout to kind of get into a negative headspace and look at your teammates and go, well, they don't seem to be burned out. It must just be me. I'm not cut out for this. That's really the wrong attitude. 
anybody can become burned out at any time for any reason, sometimes for barely any reason at all. Um, our brains are strange and mysterious sometimes. And like I said, it's a whole body experience. It's it's all of the inputs, both the ones that from home, the ones at work that lead to this. So absolutely do not fall into the pit of thinking, well, if I'm burnt out, I must just not be cut out for development. Absolutely not. Um, it is not a personal failing at any at any level. So definitely, you know, reach out, seek help. Everybody has dealt with these things at some point and will deal with these things again at some other point. And so it's really incumbent on all of us to kind of help each other out and help ourselves help each other through these things so that when we experience it, people are willing and able to help us out as well. This week's double click is pretty exciting. So our friend Debbie O'Brien, who you can follow her on Twitter at Debs underscore O'Brien. Uh, she used to be a developer advocate over at Next.js, which we all love and appreciate. But she recently started um, at a company called Bit. And so if you go to bit.dev, you can check out what they're doing. The reason I am so excited about this is because Rob and I um, do something called the PAM stack. So um, if you go to the you can check that out as well. It's, it's basically, um, you know, having conversations about building inclusive and, you know, successful development teams. Right. But um, PAM stack, the A stands for abstractions and bit.dev is a really, really great example of a tool that really everybody should start using. Um, from from boot camp up to, hey, I'm an architect at a company and I should integrate this into my process. Absolutely. So the first time I had seen this software and this product was as a really cool way to combine various types of components. Now, some people might call this architectural pattern micro front ends. I'll be honest, at some level, I don't know if I'm using the term correctly at times. I think it's a bit one of these terms that's still kind of being defined in different ways. But when people think about that, sometimes they like to think of it as individually deployable units of code. Sometimes that can just be a package or a library or a web component. But I love this idea that through this software, you can also get these kind of um, like registry or a listing of these different components. You can see previews of them. You can explore. You can see different versions of things, view documentation. I love that. And then, you know, further integration for, for pulling up in a code editor and playing with it. This idea of being able to, at a large enough organization, individually manage the components in your design system or your component library version them all differently, deploy them all differently, have that documentation centralized. What a godsend for a lot of the projects that we've worked on. So I know I've definitely been looking at it a lot lately as a potential option. Um, and I just think that this is a space that is going to be something that people really need. Uh, because up until now, people mostly either had to run their own documentation sites or just rely on an internal NPM registry and just some hastily put together you know, page that might list everything that's there. I really love this as a solution to continue to help teams, especially large teams, collaborate on building these design systems. Well, I think the other thing that's really cool is, you know, we've been, you know, in the past few years, right? Like a lot of the architects of different companies have been talking about, oh, we need to create like a shared component library because why are we building the same date picker over and over and over again, right? And um, a lot of teams have kind of been able to do this in a, uh, I don't want to say it's a hacky way, but like, you know, it's like kind of homegrown-ish in a sense. Um, whereas I feel like bit.dev basically does that for you. It allows you to manage versions. Um, it gives you dependency graphs. And it also takes the idea of like component architecture um, from just the idea of like, component architecture being important just for UI components to, hey, this is, you know, for everything. So microservices and things like that, um, you can, you know, kind of share across different teams. Um, and I also love it because as, you know, as, as a learner of JavaScript, right, like I want to learn how to do it the right way. And Debbie and I were talking recently on a podcast and, um, you know, it's like, I don't like learning and having things dumbed down for me, right? And if you're coming from a non-traditional background, you're also not getting that like computer science, high level, 
stuff that you get in college typically, um, which helps with architecture, with help with which helps with you being more of an architect on teams. Um, so what BIT really does is it allows you to architect things the right way. Think about that first. So I would encourage people with boot camps, you know, just as you're learning, even if it's a simple to do app, to use BIT to kind of learn what it means to think like this. And um, because it gives you that structure and that framework to be able to do so, so you can be successful in the future. And I think, you know, it might behoove us a little bit to s- sort of back up a bit because people might be listening to this, especially what you were just saying and sort of say, wait, is this like a new framework? Does this replace <laughs> React? Does this replace Vue? What is BIT? Um, it, it's more about the structure of the projects. Uh, and so, you know, I think this is another reason why you like it so much, Tracy, is I know, you know, another thing that we love with the PAM stack is we love CLIs. We think that having a CLI tool is a really strong um, option for uh, sort of leveling out teams and really empowering people to do things without necessarily having to have that command line knowledge or you know bespoke solutions. And so, what Bit will do is you know it's vaguely reminiscent of almost like a mono repo type structure, but they have like a lot of conventions on how to set up. A, a bit workspace, they call it. And they have a CLI that helps you sort of set it up and configure it that kind of really conforms to the patterns that they think work for sharing and composing uh, UIs out of these individual components. Yeah, I mean, the website, as you can see on screen, is one of the most fun places ever because you can hover over stuff and it tells you which component it is. And then you can click it and actually see the documentation for that component. I love it. I sat there for way too long one night, just poking around and looking at the versions of their website components. But yeah, so Tracy, while you're fixing your. uh... It's so cool. I love it so much. And, um, you know, looking at this as well, right? Like, look, you can see the different elements and the images. And, you know, I know they're more focusing on uh, the React ecosystem right now, but it does work with Vue, Angular, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, and it's open source too. So, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's free um, unless you're doing enterprise. So you definitely have options to do this. So you don't have to pay, um, you know, until you got the big bucks. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's definitely just something to play around with. Again, even if it just inspires you. I mean, that's kind yes. of the cool thing with a lot of these tools is, mm-hmm. you know, poke around, you know, sort of scaffold out a project, see how it's structured. Yeah, Maybe that informs how you structure your site. You know, you yeah. don't necessarily have to go all in on it. And I think that's what's cool with tools like this is that it yeah. gives you such tangible benefits yeah. that, you know, you might be like, well, what do we have to do to support that? Well, why don't we just buy it or use it? You know what I mean? Or, or, you know, oh, maybe if we make this one tweak, that would be super useful. And I think what they offer, if you look at some, there are a lot lot of, so we do a lot of development in lit element right now. Mm -hmm. Um, There are a few of these uh, bit.dev things set up for various lit element repositories of components. And it's Mm -hmm. super, or just web components in general, super awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, Really fun to poke around in. Cool. Well, and you know, if you're excited about this stuff, we did find it through uh, Debbie O'Brien. So check her out on Twitter at Debs underscore O'Brien. She's doing a lot of the writing of the documentation as well. So if something's missing, hit her up and she's like an amazing human being. So highly recommend. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us for this week's episode of The Retro. We had so much fun with y'all. Yeah, as always, the conversation doesn't have to stop here. So if you have any thoughts about burnout, about bit.dev, or about any other topics that you want to see us cover in future episodes of The Retro, please leave a comment down below or reach out to us on Twitter because we love to talk to people and we want to talk about the things that you all are finding interesting. Of course, if you like this content and want to see more of it, don't forget to like and subscribe so that you get notified as soon as future episodes arrive in your inbox. And now, Tracy... As always, we will end with this question, an important question, a question for the ages, which is, what did the time traveler do when she was still hungry after she had just finished a meal? She traveled back in time? She yeah, that's half right. Okay. <laughs> she went back four seconds.
Oh, that was good. That was good. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. See you next time. <laughs> that was good. I liked it. <laughs>